By nightfall of D-Day, July 10, 1943, the Allies had established a firm foothold on Sicily, and in places, some units advanced inland well beyond their objective line, suffering much lower casualties than anyone expected, while at the same time, men and equipment came ashore, in seemingly endless waves on secured beaches. And, while the success of the Allied landings exceeded all expectations, the question was, how successful the D-Day would have been, if the Italian coastal divisions offered determined resistance, instead of collapsing without putting up much of a fight. However, although Italian coastal defense had disintegrated all along the Sicilian coast, this was not the case in the center of the American beachhead, where the 1st American Division, still shaken by the Axis counterattack, used the night to regain ground lost earlier in the day. As D-Day ended, both sides used the sleepless night, to prepare for the upcoming day. After a failed counterattack the previous day, for following morning, Guzzoni ordered General Conrath to resume the attack on Geller, with the bulk of his Hermann Goering division, aiming to push the American forces back to sea, but this time, better coordinated and in conjunction with Livorno division. At about 3 a.m., amid preparation for a counterattack, Gazzoni learned the shocking news, that Syracuse had fallen, and that the situation in the eastern sector, where Kampfgruppe Schmaltz collided with advancing elements of the British 5th Infantry Division on the Syracuse-Augusta Highway, was much worse than he thought, and that the Germans there, were unable to do little more than delay the British advance onto the Catania Plain, and further to Messina. Therefore, he adjusted the plans and ordered the Livorno Division, which advanced from the northwest, to proceed towards Licata once Skeller was retaken, and deal with the American 3rd Division, while at the same time, ordering Hermann Goering Division to divert eastward, and threaten the rear of the British 8th Army, to prevent them from reaching Messina and cutting the Axis forces from the only escape route. At the same time, Gazzoni intended to order the elements of the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, which had just recently begun deploying in the western part of the island, to rejoin the rest of the division in the center of the island, ready to be deployed where and when the situation demanded, but Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, commander-in-chief of the German army in the Mediterranean, objected this move, so on a crucial day, the best German division on Sicily, remained scattered all over the island. In the meantime, for the morning attack, Conrath reorganized the Hermann Goring division into three columns, by splitting Kompfgruppe right into two battle groups, centered around two panzer battalions reinforced with the infantry from miscellaneous engineer and flak units. Further west, on their right flank, four battalions from the 33rd and 34th regiments of the Livorno Division, along with the remnants of Mobile Group E, who were to support Germans, made the final preparations for the counterattack, scheduled to begin at 6 a.m. In front of them, stood American infantry and the various airborne bands, holding the thin line consisting mainly of strongpoints with hastily prepared shallow foxholes, lacking anti-tank artillery and other heavy weapons, and without any tank support. To reinforce the most endangered sector of the American beachhead, General Patton ordered a floating reserve of the 7th U.S. Army, including tanks from the 2nd Armored Division ashore, in support of the 1st and 45th Divisions. However, because of problems landing tanks in the soft sand, most of the troops landed, were infantry from the 41st Armored Infantry Regiment rather than the tanks, and in the morning of July 11, four fresh infantry battalions of the Army's Reserve, began disembarking on American beachhead. At the same time, considering the situation on the beachhead unstable, General Patton cancelled a second American airborne drop, designated as Operation Husky II, scheduled for that night. By dawn, everything was ready for the most desperate battle of the campaign on Sicily, and with the first daylight of July 11, the Axis attack began, backed by German and, and Italian aircraft, which pounded the Allied beachhead, and attacked the shipping lying offshore without almost any opposition, as Allied aircraft had been grounded on Malta, and Pontel area by fog. At 6.15 am, after being delayed for 15 minutes, all three columns of the Hermann Goering division jumped off, following the same general direction, as they did the day before, and in contrast to the previous day's attack, this one was executed on a much broader front, and was far better coordinated, despite the disrupted radio communications between German, 
and Italian units. Once they saw the German tanks moving out, at 6.30 am, all three Italian columns also moved into the attack, down the roads leading into Gela from the west, and by 7 am, the two central columns of the Livorno division, broke through the American main line, reaching the western outskirts of Gela, where they began fighting the rangers in the streets of the town, with only the westmost column's advance halted, by the elements from the 30th Regiment of the American 3rd Division. While at first, everything seemed to be going according to plan, soon, the Italian troops came under heavy fire from the light cruiser USS Savannah and nearby American artillery, which killed or wounded half of the attackers, and after two hours of fierce fighting against a small number of rangers, who used captured Italian artillery guns against them, at about 8.30 am, the Italians finally fell back. The rangers followed them quickly, taking about 400 stunned and dazed prisoners. Meanwhile, all three of the Hermann Goring division's columns surged forward. On the German right flank, about 60 medium tanks of the reinforced 2nd Battalion of the Hermann Goring Panzer Regiment, moving down the State Highway 117, overran the 1st Battalion of the 26th Infantry Regiment, and rapidly pushed back the center of the Big Red One. The central column, consisting of the reinforced 1st Battalion of the Hermann Goring Panzer Regiment, led by General Conrath himself, moved across open ground along Nisimi Priolo Road, where they broke the American line held by the 2nd Battalion of the 16th Regiment, and some paratroopers, and in the center, the situation quickly dissolved into a series of scattered infantry versus tank combat. As the many American infantry and paratrooper groups remained bypassed by the bulk of advancing Germans and isolated in small pockets of resistance. On the right flank of the American beachhead, the 45th American Division fare no better, when Kampfgruppe left, spearheaded by several remaining Tiger tanks, broke through the line, held by what was left of the 180th Regiment, driving their battered elements back to Biazzo Ridge, from where the Americans had a good view on the nearby road and road junction, a little more than two kilometers from the beach. And when the battle reached its peak, some 260 paratroopers, led by Colonel James Gavin, the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment's commander, arrived on the ridge. Under Gavin's determined leadership, the tiny American force held out, despite fierce German pressure, using two 75mm howitzers acquired on the way, and now employed in a direct fire anti-tank role, along with several bazookas they had available, which proved ineffective against Tiger tanks. Facing stiffer resistance, and after coming under increasing artillery and naval shelling, confusion rose among the Germans and their attack stalled, until they were finally driven back later in the day, by a decisive counterattack led by the paratroopers, and supported with fresh reinforcements arrived from the beachhead, including several Sherman tanks. As he could no longer be restrained aboard his flagship, USS Monrovia, at 9.30 am, General Patton came ashore, on the most critical sector of the American beachhead, in front of Geller, where he met General Terry Allen, the 1st Division's commander. Once Patton saw the advancing German tanks coming down the road, he yelled to a young naval officer standing nearby with a radio, If you can connect with your goddamn navy, tell them for God's sake, to drop some shell fire on the road, and shortly after, shells from the cruiser USS Boise began to hammer the advancing tanks. Soon, destroyers USS Glennon, USS Butler, and USS Beatty, joined the shelling while the USS Savannah, after dealing with the threat posed by the Livorno division, shifted fire on the advancing German column. However, despite the ferocious fire poured by destroyers and cruisers into Gela Plain, the German advance seemed unstoppable, with the only force that stood between them and the beach, was a handful of already exhausted rangers, and the 32nd Field Artillery Battalion, that just recently arrived on the beachhead. Immediately as Artillery Battalion disembarked, Patton ordered them to move into the sand dunes on the very edge of the invasion beaches, and fire their 105mm howitzers directly at the German tanks, while at the same time, General Allen, gathered everyone who could handle a weapon to hold hastily formed defensive positions, in the sand dunes and the streets and buildings of Geller. By the time they got some two kilometers to the coast, 
the deadly combination of direct artillery fire and navy fusillade, was too much for the men of the Hermann Goring division, who gradually began withdrawing. After witnessing the destruction of over 40 of his tanks, and failing to gain control of the division's rear, at 2 p.m., Conrath called off the attack and ordered his troops to fall back, in stages toward their starting positions. Later in the afternoon, with the arrival of the first troops of the 18th Regiment from the 1st Division's Reserve, along with tanks of Combat Command B, from the 2nd Armored Division, the tide of the battle turned in the American favor, and the German withdrawal, which started slow, picked up speed as the day wore on. During the night, men of Big Red One, advanced some five kilometers inland, capturing Ponte Olivo airfield in the early hours of July 12, and decimating remnants of many units from the Livorno division along the way. The fighting dragged on throughout the night, and by the end of the day, Hermann Göring division had only 54 tanks serviceable, out of the original 99, and only 7 operational Tiger tanks, out of 17. Total German losses were 630 dead and wounded, while Livorno division was even harder hit, suffering over 2,100 casualties. The combined Italian-German attack on Geller on July 11 was by far the strongest Axis counteroffensive of the campaign, and while it slowed the advance in the center portion of the American landing zone, it had no long-term impact for the rest of the campaign. However, poor communication between Axis commanders, led Gazzoni to believe that the counterattack was a success, and with news arriving at his headquarters throughout the morning, including the reports that Americans were re-embarking on their landing craft and fleeing, it looked as if victory in the Geller sector was in sight. Therefore, having a completely wrong picture of the real situation, Gazzoni ordered Conrath to wheel the Hermann Goering division eastwards, towards Vittoria to attack the advancing British forces, and it was not until the evening, that Gazzoni finally learned, that counter-attack had failed. Meanwhile, on the extreme left flank of the American beachhead, the 3rd Division, under Major General Lucien K. Truscott, fought its own battle, virtually in isolation after they, at dawn on July 11, resumed advance west with the 7th and 15th Regiments, supported by the tanks of the Combat Command A from the 2nd Armored Division. By the end of the day, the 3rd Division had advanced over 25 kilometers to the west of Licata, destroying a few Italian units they encountered along the way, and colliding with the 129th Panzer Grenadier Regiment of the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, in the vicinity of Canicati. Unfortunately for the Americans, beating off the German-Italian counterattack at Geller, and the rapid advance of the 3rd Division, did not mark the end of the day's events. To top off the suffering, the fierce fighting, and being on the verge of being thrown back into the sea, this hard day in the American sector, ended with another tragedy. After being postponed for one day, at about 8.40 p.m., the first wave of C-47 transport planes, carrying some 2,300 paratroopers of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, from the 82nd Airborne Division, who were to reinforce Gavin's 505th Regiment as part of Operation Husky II, arrived over Sicily. According to the plan, 144 aircraft from the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing, were to fly over the Allied invasion fleet to the drop zone on the Geller Plain. However, after having endured 23 Axis air attacks during the day, including a recent night attack, it was an understatement to say, that Navy and Army anti-aircraft gunners were trigger-happy, and what was supposed to be a friendly zone, turned out to be, not so friendly at all. And while the paratroopers of the first wave, jumped from their planes without incident, as the subsequent waves approached the island, flying on a clear sky with plenty of moonlight, they were hit by the devastating anti-aircraft fire, from virtually every anti-aircraft gun on U.S. Navy ships at sea, and from land, that torn them to pieces. The end result of this friendly fire incident was devastating, as out of the 144 C-47 transport planes, 23 were shot down, while the other 37 suffered significant damage. 81 paratroopers died, 132 were wounded, and 16 were missing, including the 82nd Division Assistant Commander, Brigadier General Charles L. Kierans Jr., 
With these casualties, the total losses of the 7th U.S. Army on July 11 climbed to over 2,300 dead, wounded and missing, the highest American one-day loss, during the Battle of Sicily. Further east, the British 8th Army, had a trouble of a different kind, best illustrated by a diary record from the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, of the 1st Canadian Division, which stated, the only difficulties regiment encountered, were enthusiastic greetings of the civilian population, and the frantic endeavour of the military population to surrender. The Canadians, advancing on the southernmost end of the British beachhead, moved swiftly towards the American 7th Army, encountering barely any resistance, while being slowed only by the cheerful crowd of the local population, who came into the streets to greet the arriving Allied troops. By July 12, the 1st Canadian Division, established contact with elements of the 45th Division near Ragusa, creating a continuous Allied front line. To their north, the 51st Division also made good progress, advancing inland some 20 kilometers, just like the 50th Division from the 13th Corps on their right, with both divisions took many prisoners, mainly from the destroyed 206th Coastal Division, while the few German units in the area, slipped away. During the day, the two divisions established contact, forming a single line along the 8th Army's front. The only division in the British sector, which encountered proper resistance, was the 5th Division on its way towards Augusta. On July 11, the 17th Brigade, ran into the forward positions of Kampfgruppe Schmaltz from the Hermann Göring Division, on the southern approaches to Augusta, which successfully held them up, by putting out the determined defence. Meanwhile, the 13th Brigade, attacked Solarino on Kampfgruppe Schmaltz's right flank, held by the 75th Infantry Regiment of Napoli Division, but unfortunately for Schmaltz, Napoli Division, proved no better than the Italian Coastal Divisions, so Solarino fell, without the British suffering a single casualty. Unlike the other officers in the Hermann Göring Division, who came from various Luftwaffe units, Colonel Wilhelm Schmaltz, was a highly decorated army officer, attached to the division as an instructor and advisor, and now, with his flank exposed and with no reserves behind him, he skillfully led his unit against a much stronger opponent, and by implementing a series of delaying actions, he began withdrawing in stages, further north towards Lentini, a strategically important crossroad, leaving the port of Augusta undefended. However, instead of the approaching British, he was more concerned about his Italian allies from the Napoli division on his right flank, which, as Kesselring put it, melted into thin air, with the bulk of its force, either captured or deserted. Napoli Division, met its final end on the morning of July 13, when its commander, General Giulio Cesare Gotti Porcinari, was taken prisoner by advancing British troops, and from then onwards, Napoli Division ceased to exist as an independent combat force, while its remaining few units, mostly artillery and some infantry, were attached to the Hermann Göring Division. Furthermore, not only did the collapse of the 206th Coastal Division and Napoli Division, expose the German flank, but at the same time, it created a huge gap between Kampfgruppe Schmaltz and the rest of the Hermann Göring Division, endangering Catania and, ultimately, Messina. The British swiftly took advantage of the German retreating north, and on the evening of July 12th, Men of the 1st Special Raiding Squadron of the 2nd Special Air Service Regiment, landed from the sea, in largely deserted Augusta, which fell into British hands after small skirmishes in town's streets, against the rear guard of Kampfgruppe Schmaltz. The fall of Augusta, as well as the failure of counterattacks against the 7th Army at Geller, signalled the Axis commanders, that it was time to abandon any form of offensive action, and shift to a strict defence. On the morning of July 12, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, showed up at the 6th Italian Army Headquarters at Enna, to meet with Gazzoni, and assess the situation on the island. By then, they both knew that Sicily could no longer be held, and that evacuation of troops across the Strait of Messina, remained their only option, judging therefore, that the British advance, posed a much greater threat. To slow down the British 8th Army, and in an effort to establish a continuous front, striving to contain the Allies as far south as possible, as long as possible, Gazzoni ordered the Hermann Göring Division, 
to shift northeast of Coltogironi, while to cover Conrad's withdrawal, he ordered the battered Livorno division to establish a line from Mazzarino to Coltogironi. At the same time, the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division was to disengage from fighting against American forces and move to the center of the island in the vicinity of Enna to act as the 6th Army's mobile reserve. Furthermore, to reinforce the most endangered sector of the Axis defense, held by Kampfgruppe Schmaltz in front of Catania, Kesselring authorized air dropping of the 3rd Parachute Regiment from the German 1st Parachute Division, stationed in southern France, and in the afternoon of July 12, the first 1,400 paratroopers of the 3rd Parachute Regiment made a para drop in wheat fields south of Catania. Reinforced by the Parachute Regiment, Kampfgruppe Schmaltz, turned into a far more formidable force, and to help close the gap between his Kampfgruppe and the rest of the Hermann Goring division, Schmaltz ordered the 2nd Parachute Battalion to rush to Fronsfonti, while the rest of the regiment took defensive positions between Lentini and the sea. Meanwhile, instead of withdrawing as instructed by Gazzoni, on the morning of July 12, acting on his own, Conrath ordered yet another attack in the area around Gela, expecting that after two days of combat, the American defense would collapse. However, by that time, the Americans were well dug in, and had plenty of artillery and tanks available. Despite an initial success, when German infantry, spearheaded by Tiger tanks, broke through the line held by the 18th Regiment, reducing its 2nd Battalion to about 200 men, with the help of the men from the neighboring 16th Regiment, and tanks from Combat Command B, the German attack was quickly beaten off. Now, Conrad finally had had enough, so he ordered the Hermann Goring division to withdraw to the hills south of Nisimi, as the first stage of his move towards Coltogironi. With the withdrawal of the Axis powers to the center of the island, the campaign on Sicily entered a new phase, and the final outcome became more and more obvious. In just three days, the events in Sicily, set off a domino effect, that would have, not only a military, but also a great political impact, on the rest of the war.